Lord, we are grateful that you are strong and kind, that you came to rescue us by the power that you have through the cross that you bore. And now you are the word incarnate, and you speak through the word in scripture. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts, that you would take away distractions, that we would look to you for salvation, because in you is salvation. It belongs to you. It's from you and to you and by your very work. So, Lord, we ask that you would just speak to us in the midst of Ephesians here as we look again in your word, and may we wonder and worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, or a pew Bible there in front of you, or an app on your phone, uh, open up to Ephesians 1, and if you would stand with me as I read the word, uh, we're going to be in Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. At the, this is the end of the longest sentence in the Bible. So we're finally at the, the end, the last section here. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed by, with the promise of the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word as we look into this. You know, I'm not very good with DIY projects. I remember in seminary, I had to, I was working on my car because when you don't have money, you end up trying to do things yourself. And I was trying to do a, change the brakes via YouTube. <laughs> and let me just say, sometimes there are things left out of the instructions on YouTube that you go, I don't know how this goes back together. So I found myself driving very slowly to the auto shop, trying to not have to use my brake setup <laughs> because my car was making horrible noises. And I knew that talking to other mechanics, they said, oh no, you have to, you need to have someone else do this. Brakes are too important. Well, the thing about the Christian life, it's a lot like this. We don't always get things right when we think we're, we can do it ourselves. And we should not have confidence in ourselves. We have to have confidence in Christ. So th think of the fallen condition. We lack confidence when we look to our own selves. That's our fallen nature condition. That's what we are in our sinful self. We need God's word today to speak assurance, objective assurance that is found not in our failure, but in Christ's righteousness, in the, the Holy Spirit working. So, so the, the big idea we're going to talk about today is that God gives us assurance in the past, in the present, and through his active presence, because the Holy Spirit connects us to the benefits of his gospel. So that this is a, a big part of the Christian life that many times we go, well, I've, I'm saved, so I'm, I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do. But the reality is we need the Holy Spirit to work. We can't do it on our own. We didn't come to Christ on our own, and he's not left us on our own. So we need the Holy Spirit to work in your lives through the gospel. So the first point here is God gives assurance through the Spirit's past faithfulness. God gives us assurance through the Spirit's past faithfulness. It's God's heart, his plan, and praise that in Christ we have obtained an inheritance. We have, it's in him. The very first words here in this section is in him. Abiding in Christ should change everything. Everything within our lives, if you think about it, abiding in Christ is not something that you keep to yourself. But praise him, apart from Jesus, our future is not hopeful, but tragic. It's only in Christ 
that our future is one of hope. Amen. Ephesians 1 7, which we, we talked about in a previous week, in him we have what? Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our, of our trespasses according to the riches of what? His grace. It's his rich grace that reaches out, grabs us, and makes us his own. The grace of God should not be quickly gone past. In fact, that grace is what brings us to union with Christ. One with Christ. It means we are heirs of the blessing and the promises made by God. And the Holy Spirit is the one that keeps us in those blessings and promises. That should be encouraging to us because so many times, it, maybe I'm preaching to myself, probably am, but probably many of us, we feel our failures. We sense that we can't do everything that God has called us to in our own strength. And that's a good thing to remember. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. This is in Romans 8. So notice the we here. This we is connected to, in this passage, is connected to the covenant faithfulness to the Jews. And the you is going to be connected to us as Gentiles. So when it says we, it's connected to the Jewish believers who were the first to believe. So Paul's making this identification for the chosen Jews to underscore the nature of God's past faithfulness. God didn't discard the Jews, but he worked through the Jews to bring Christ onto the scene by his power, by his Holy Spirit, but it was beyond anything that any, anyone back then would have imagined or thought possible, that God himself steps into our existence. It blows your mind to think that Jesus became like us. He took on humanity, almost like when we go, come to the communion table and we take on the bread and the wine, he took in our humanity. He took on flesh and blood. It just boggles the mind. And so God reveals the beauty of his heart, his plan, the reasons for his praise, that it all powerful and gave encouragements to the imperfect Ephesian believers. He's showing how perfect he is in the midst of our imperfect lives, our imperfect realities, that the perfection of Christ comes to bear on every part of our lives today. This should be encouraging because it's, it, it then leads to adoption. Adoption is a glorious prospect when you think about it. The family of God is now where we belong, but before we belonged to the kingdom of darkness and of death and of sin, and yet we're adopted. But when, you, when the fullness of time had come, Galatians 4 writes, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you're sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your, our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Again, this is the idea of living as children of God. It's living in total dependence of our Abba, Father. Not living as if, okay, God saved me, now I have to do this other thing. No, living out of that goodness, of the kindness that the Holy Spirit brings us to the Father, that we cry out to the Father, we have obtained an inheritance, our lot or portion. That, that word inheritance is a portion has been given to you, riches of grace, blessings in Christ. We are to live to the praise of whose glory? His glory. So all this is the connectedness that God is working. He's, he's brought us to Christ. He's obtained the inheritance. He's adopted us. In the Greek, uh, the inheritance indicates that we are apportioned an inheritance. For we are those who made, are made to, to be the inheritance rather than those who have obtained an inheritance. So the idea here is that God has given us an inheritance, but we are also an inheritance to him. The apostle is making it clear that God's love is based on something in his heart rather than anything that we could achieve or claim in ourselves. Think about that. God has done this, and it's glorious. The loving faithfulness of God 
that is revealed in Christ is the cause, is the, is the, the gift that God has given. In fact, Deuteronomy says, you weren't a people that was great. You, you, you weren't a people that were, you were chosen because you were so good, but you are chosen because God has placed on you his love. You are his treasured possession of all the people of the earth. But it's not because of the number or how great you are, but you're the fewest of all people. It's not because of your righteousness, Deuteronomy goes on to say, or integrity. The Lord your God is giving you this land to possess, but you're a stiff-necked people. So remember this and never forget that you provoke the God, your God, the Lord, to anger in the desert. See, the concept of choosing is actually being used here to comfort God's people. Paul wants everyone to remember that we are loved not because of what is in us, but because what is in God himself. This, this turns the world's idea of religion on its head. The loving faithfulness of God that is revealed in Christ is the cause for be, us being his. He's chosen us. Remember, he's chosen us. That, that should bring wonder and praise to our lips, that the inheritance, he shows up to rescue and redeem a people, to make his own possession and give us unlimited riches in Christ. This portion of riches that is in an inheritance is limitless. Unlike earthly inheritances, which run out, it's not a portion that he's saying, you just get this much. He's saying, you have all of me. What an amazing God we, are, we have. In, uh, earlier in, in Ephesians 1, 5 and 6, it says, In love he predestined us. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has, which, which he has blessed us in the beloved. Because we are in Christ, because he has chosen, he's gone after us, redeemed us. He didn't leave us on our own. The Old Testament, New Testament, all the people of God are called to be his portion and his inheritance. And being his inheritance, he's not going to abandon us. He's not going to leave us to our own devices. He is going to rescue again and again. This is by God's own choosing, for he is the active agent who apportions the inheritance by his own loving, predestined purpose. This isn't based on, he didn't wait for you to do something good. Instead, before time began, he set his love on you. Amen. And that's what gives confidence to the Ephesians. The Ephesians are in a wicked and idolatrous culture. One of the biggest temples, the biggest temple in the world to Aphrodite is there. It's, it's known in the all around them is magical thinking of, you know, I just have to do this, and then I can change my fate. But you know what? The gospel is that we can do nothing apart from him. He predestines, and out of the overflowing inheritance in Christ, both present and future are secure because of Christ. It's all to him, for him, through him, to his glory. The will, the will of God purpose in Christ to bring all things. Remember last week we talked, or not last week, Steve did a great job last week, but last week, uh, the, the week pre previously, we talked about Ephesians 1.10. All things are in heaven and earth are being brought under one head, and that's Jesus. They're being summed up under Jesus, and God plans to bring everything under his Son. Even now, the Father is making everything work together for that purpose, for his glory and our good. If we love him. Ephesians 5, 8, and 10, 8 through 10 says, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were what? Still sinners. Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, how much more are we saved by him from what? The wrath of God. The wrath of God is already on us when we're born. But God has, from eternity past, set his love on us. What, a, what, an amazing, what an amazing God we have. God's choice secures us in him as our true inheritance, as our true riches in his grace, in his mercy. So when we go, 
when we go into and see the magnificent views and look through uh, all that God has done in his creation, if you look, take a microscope and take one of the many flowers out in the fields or what, the leaves that are now falling, and you look at it, 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 it all whispers the glory of God. You see that we are moved in these moments when we see the glory of God in creation. And God is coordinating his plan to bring glory to his son as the head of all things. This is his purpose. This is why he predestined from the foundations of the world. It's because his glory should not go, will not go, unseen and untold. And so we are meant to reflect that goodness through the gospel that is functioning in our lives. So the purpose, first, the chosen people, the Jews, we, he says we are the first ones to put their hope, and his purpose is to show hope in Christ. They exist to show the praise and glory of God. We are the first ones to hope in Christ is what it says right there. Hope is not some wishful thinking. I think we, in our culture, we use hope in a very different way than they did in the New Testament. Hope was a sure thing. It wasn't like, I hope the Bills win the Super Bowl, or I hope something else happens, but instead hope was a sure thing. I'm not saying the Bills aren't going to win the Super Bowl, but we don't know that, right? It's a hope. It's a hope. It's a, but, but in this, it's a hope that is secured in the person and work of Christ. That is a sure hope. Out of all the nations, the Jews were chosen so that they would be the first to show this. Praise should be the amazing and show the amazing heart of God, that praise, praise, praise. Where does our hope lie? That's the question. Spurgeon says, I love this quote, he says, my hope lives not because I'm not a sinner, but because I am a sinner for whom Christ died. My trust is not that I am holy, but that being unholy, Christ is my righteousness. My hope, my faith rests not upon what I am or shall be, or feel to know or know, but on who Christ is and what he has done and what he is now doing for me. So may that reflect the praise that he is due. Living to the praise of his glory is, is what we're called to. If you've ever seen the movie uh, Joe versus the Volcano, it's, it's an old movie for you young kids, but uh, Tom Hanks at one point is, 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 is very young Tom Hanks is on this raft, and he's thinking about all the, the problems that he's had in his life, all the mistakes, all of his failures, and he looks up at the stars, and at first they seem like they don't connect. And then suddenly he starts seeing the constellations, and he sees kind of the order of the universe and the plan of the whole universe in, in, in how the glory of God is shown in the sky. And he speaks to the heavens at one point. It's kind of interesting. I don't think you'd see this in, in a, a movie today. But he says, God, I thank you for my life. I did not know that you were so big. I had forgotten. God has a whole universe plan that we can't, can't be undermined. We can't, we can't mess it up. Our whole lives are designed to give him glory. Sin and failure will not stop his plan for Israel or for you. God's plan is certain and it's going to happen. The lines of God connect the events of the past and the events of our lives and the experiences of others so that all might be to the praise of his glory. That is what God's doing. God, God's glory is who he is. His essence, his power, his majesty, his purity and holiness, we live to the praise of a God of all glory, declaring that he is the one true God who made everything. Isn't that amazing? God is so good. So we, we see God's past faithfulness, and we see that it leads to faithful, uh, his faithfulness in the past shows us his faithfulness in the present of a weak people, that we need God presently, every day, moment by moment, so God gives assurance through the Spirit's present faithfulness. This is objective assurance that God gives through his 
pres- the Spirit's present faithfulness. That's, that's point two. So God gives assurance through the Spirit's present faithfulness. So he's expanding his covenantal vision here in the people's understanding as the Ephesian believers are reading all this in, in their mixed congregation. So think of this. These are Jews and Gentiles together in Ephesus, one of the largest cities in Rome. It's, the, I think, the third largest city at the time. And so the apostle speaks to the Ephesian Gentiles, and he says, and you also, you're included in Christ's plan. This is how Paul sees our salvation, the Christian life, the covenantal promises to the Jewish nation are now extended to the Gentiles. This co-inclusion in Christ shows the theological basis for Paul's later argument that Jews and Gentiles now are fellow members of the same family and the same body of Christ that were grafted in. Isn't that, that, that should just bring praise when you think about the fact that we were once far off and now God's brought us close. He's grafted us into his family through the gospel. Not because of how good we are, but because of who Christ is and how good he is. Having, having no hope without God in the world, Ephesians 2 will tell us later, he says, having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by what? The blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ. So we have heard the word of truth, and this word of truth is referred to as the gospel because you had uh, Colossians 1.5 says, because of this hope laid up for you in heaven, Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, which is the gospel. God's plan is for the present age of our time and who everyone who hears the gospel, God's purpose is being brought about. His purpose is coming about to bring many sons and daughters to glory. What a gracious God we have, because we don't deserve that. We deserve wrath, it says, but yet he gives us his grace and mercy. He extends it to us as the least of sin, the most sinful. And so Christ is the Word incarnate. It says the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen the glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This grace and truth that Christ extends, he's extending his mercy to a sinful people. He extended it to Israel. He's now extending it to the world. And God, from eternity past, knew all of this would unfold. He predestined it. God's involvement of all things in his plan is more than just an expansion of the covenant, it's an extension of his mercy. It's not an expansion of, it is an expansion of his covenant, but it's an extension of his mercy getting bigger and bigger, growing. What did did the Jews do to be the chosen people? What did they do? They did nothing. They did nothing, really. God's blessing was based on his mercy, not on their merit. And same with the gospel. The gospel is salvation for those who believe. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for everyone to believe, who believes. For in righteousness of God is, the, is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So the righteousness is being revealed through Christ. And it's his righteousness is objective. Not our works, his work. And so that's what we, we as gospel people, as belief in the good news, not the good advice of religion, it's the good news that he has rescued, he's redeemed, he's saved. The Gentiles' inclusion is not, does not rest on their own doing, but simply hearing the gospel and believing. So repenting and believing in the gospel. Repenting from sin, turning to Christ, truly hearing the message of God's mercy was itself a sign of inclusion in the covenant before anything else had been or could be done. And he said, John 6, 65, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So we believe in him. We rest in him. He is the one that does the work. We are the one that receive the benefit. The greatest Think about this, the the greatness can be comprehended only by remembering the pagan context of the Ephesians world. See, human pride, false morality, 
and even deceitful idolatry had all thrived within Ephesus. But then God calls the people from, from this place to be his own. Before they had done anything to qualify for his, this love of, and, and this sign of great grace, God's willingness to be faithful in the face of great human frailty, sin, and unfaithfulness shows how the wonders of his mercy, shows the, uh, the abounding love that only Christ gives. Christ is glorified both because more persons are subjected under his rule and because his care for them shows how big he is. The big picture is being a part of God's plan means all things happen for our good and his glory so we can rest in him. There's big mercy to be had within our big God. This is about his mercy, not our merit or accomplishment. He is powerfully working. He's greater than we are. He's at work throughout all history to make us his own and to make many his own. Our salvation could never be dependent on get us getting everything right. It's not dependent yesterday on us getting everything right, today or ever. It's on our good and gracious God being righteous, trusting in him to save. The big plan he's doing will not be undone by anything that we can do. He is making everything right. He's bringing many sons and daughters. Christ is making, I, I love that phrase, if you ever have read The Lord of the Rings, the phrase that he's making all the sad things become untrue. Because Sam wakes up and he realizes Gandalf and all of his friends are there at the end. And he turns and he says, are all the sad things going to become untrue now? And that's what God's doing through heaven, through his son. He's undoing the effects of sin. He's disentangling the spell that this world is under thinking that they have things right and they're under the evil spell, if you really think about it. We need a gospel to release people from that. We need to tell people of the good news of Jesus. He is working. Don't underestimate his working. Sometimes we, we, we so emphasize God's sovereign, eternal plan that we virtually shut out any human participation in the spread of the gospel. But look at what God's word says here. We put our lives in God's service for the sake of the gospel. We are instruments for his glory, not merely observers of his sovereignty. So when, when Calvin preached in Geneva, it was not merely for doctrinal understanding. Visit his church, and you will still learn how great this great expounder of God's sovereignty welcomed people from all over the world and then prepared them to gush forth from Geneva to take the gospel to others. Confidence in God's sovereign working of God, his sovereign plan, gives us the greatest delight and zeal to participate within that plan. That we don't have to worry about the results. God brings the results. We tell of him. And that's what we're called to do. He, it should affect every part of us. And as God's people... We extend God's mercy and glory, and in having experienced great mercy from God, we spread his glory wherever we go. Nothing is futile. Even our failures are not determinative of God's final outcome. God uses human people, human fail, um, flawed people, to bring glory to his Son, and he will prevail. If you ever look at... Uh, Rainbows. I love seeing rainbows. I don't know. I, you know, you look out, and when you see a rainbow, it's magnificent. And whenever you see it, you, you appreciate the glory that God is doing there. But you know what? You can never see a complete rainbow from the ground. The rainbow that you see from the ground, even if it's a complete arc, is not the complete rainbow. If you were to go up on a high mountain or get into a plane and look down at a rainbow, it would look like a circle. Because God's promises, his provision, never end. And many times, we're blocked from seeing the full picture of what God's doing. Yet, when the earth does not get in the way, you then see God's design. And that's what we need to see. Paul moves the earth aside so that we can see God's entire plan. He lifts us above the earthly perspective, showing 
showing our lives from the perspective of heaven. And, and, and there, we see the whole design of human history. We are raised above the limitations of our sin and our finitude so that we will see from the beginning God chose us in love. He made a people for his own and promised that from them would come those who would believe in Christ and, and those who would be his instrument to tell others so that the world would come together in the praise of his glory. All things are being worked together to the conformity of Christ's purpose and plan, to the praise of his glory. See, God's perspective on the <clears throat> flies in the face of other perspectives is at odds with a secular world. You think about the secular world, they think of the here and now as the only thing that exists. But we use, we use language to divine purpose and design, not random chance. It's not random chance that we exist. It's for God's glory. It's at odds with a personal world where they, there's questions and doubts of God's design due to pain and suffering and troubles and sin. But we see a God that's bigger than that because of what he's doing and what he has done. It is so hard to see divine design when you come to illness, when your child is ill, or when the church seems to be troubled by needless debates and, cons and all things that are happening, when you struggle to hold a family together or simply to make financial ends meet. Yet, when our eyes see the full rainbow of Scripture, the completeness of God's plan, and know by faith that our lives are a part of God's design no matter what happens, then we can take whatever comes because we know that we exist not for ourselves, but as part of his glory. That gives us extreme, extreme comfort. When you think of how the world is from the beginning, the world was made to be good and for his glory, for God's glory. And then like a balloon punctured, it was deflated at the fall. The glory uh, was left crumpled as remains of human misery and earth uh, corrupted by the fall of, of Adam. And yet, ever since, according to the nature that is in him, the Lord has been following a predetermined plan to refill that balloon and make it more glorious than ever with his mercy, ever expanding and extending the balloon to its original glory. First, the mercy was extended to a chosen people through no merit of their own. And then from them came those who were the first to believe in Christ. And then they carried the message of mercy to other nations, who now, as a result, we are now standing in the grace of God for his glory. We stand. Expounding, expounding this promise, the, the Holy Spirit seals us. So think about sealing. What does it mean that the Holy Spirit seals us? We are called to bless God because of the gift, the Holy Spirit, who now indwells us. He hasn't left us on our own. Uh, but you are also, by, also the means by which we are sealed is a guarantee that we will have or will receive our promised inheritance. Uh, Ezekiel 36, which in the men's Bible study on, on Saturday, we haven't quite got there, but, but that's, that's where we're marching to, is Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27. And I will give you a new heart in a new spirit, and I will put within you, uh, it, I, a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey your rules. So, so this, the idea of sealing, of being sealed by the spirit, conveys at least four different ideas and probably more. Um, it, it conveys security. God is watching and guarding you by his spirit. Uh, authentication. God is saying, I, I haven't left you. I'm right there with you. Uh, genuineness. It, he genuinely saves and personally delivers you to himself. And then identification of his ownership over you. God is to be blessed because he seals believers with his spirit, claiming them as his own and securing our inheritance in Christ. In Christ, that's the inheritance. That's where, where God has, has, holds us close to himself. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and has also put his seal on us and given his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. This is 2 Corinthians 1, 21 through 22. God gives his spirit as a guarantee. He seals us. 
May we grasp that such a vast, it's intricate, vast, intimate plan is true and applies to us by his spirit. See the difference it makes believing that the trials as well as the accomplishments, the, the difficulties as well as the joys, these are not brute forces or random chance, but it's all part of God's eternal tapestry of a plan for his glory and our good. So does he bring assurance that such astounding truths do apply to us? I would say yes. He brings assurance that they apply to us. He has not left us on our own. So the assurance that's, that reminds us of past faithfulness, present faithfulness, but also of the Spirit's ongoing faithfulness. So the, the third point there is God gives assurance through the Spirit's sealing faithfulness. He seals us. And so God's promise is guaranteed to in the Holy Spirit. If you think about sealing... It's, it, there's many times in the Bible where you see this concept of something being sealed. And, and one of the first ones is Noah. Noah goes into the ark, and God seals the door. He, he seals them, guaranteeing their salvation. It's the promise that God is going to bring them through the judgment into new life with him. And the guarantee is a function, it's a down payment. This is the idea of God, of, let's say you go to buy a house. And what do you do? Do you say, oh, I'll buy the house, you can trust me? No, you put a down payment on there, usually a large amount, that says, yes, I have the financing, I'm going to buy the house, here is an amount to guarantee that I'm coming back to buy this house. And that's, God has given his people, the Holy Spirit, with the expectation and the assurance that the full inheritance is soon to come. It's not a, it's not a wish, a pie in the sky wish, it is a fully guaranteed hope that God is coming soon. And as part of God's redemptive plan, he marks with a seal that guarantees we receive the full rights of God's inheritance as, as his kingdom is coming and everything will be made right. The, the Holy Spirit is not just the mark of God that we are his possession. The Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing the redemption is sure to come. It's not, it's not just... Some, some other wish thought, it is the deposit that everything will be made right one day. The first fruits of a crop coming in, and the rest is sure to come. These are the ideas of, of God's working as a sealing his believers, sealing his children. The Spirit is the first evidence of the full promise of God's complete plan of salvation. You were included, it says, you were included in Christ when you heard the words of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, then you were at that time marked in him with the promised seal. The proof of the presence of the Holy Spirit is not in, indic, indicated by the distant expression of an extraordinary charismatic gifts. It is a God who has brought us saving faith. It's not some other that we're looking for. It's God himself. Belief itself indicates the presence of the seal, the mark of the, the Holy Spirit. Guarantees us as God's children, because without the Spirit, we could not and would not believe. And so the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. They think of him as folly. And so it's only because of God's gracious Spirit that we can discern what is true. See, our, Spurgeon writes, our hope in Christ for the future is the mainspring and the mainstay of our joy down here today. It's the mainspring. It's, if you think of a mainspring back, uh, I, as a kid I had gotten a watch where you would wind it up every day, right? There, there was a mainspring in the watch itself. And so the Spirit kind of winds our lives every day, reminding us what Christ has done, reminding us the good news of the gospel, that it's not good advice, but it's something that's already secure in Christ himself. And this is something that gives us hope because it's not a maybe or a I hope it's going to happen. It's a surety. God's inheritance is here and it's coming through the Holy Spirit. Promises are fulfilled by God's word and his spirit. Think of Abraham and Isaac, right? Abraham is waiting for a, a son, an heir. And what does he do? He goes out and he says, 
well, God's not giving it to, to me in the time that I want. And so he goes and seeks, you know, his wife goes, well, here's Hagar. And so Hagar gives birth, and God says, no, that's not the son. There's still a son to come. The whole idea here is that God's promises are fulfilled in God's ways. God's ways are what we look for. Paul speaks of an inheritance while he's sitting there in a prison in the midst of Rome. And he speaks all throughout the prison epistles of the hope we have in Christ. This, this is a powerful statement because think about it. You're sitting in, in prison. Most of us would sit there and go, well, this is hopeless. But the reality is Paul is looking not to his circumstances. He's looking again and again to Jesus. So Jesus spoke of the inheritance of the kingdom and the eternal life in his ministry, in, in the midst of being persecuted. And even in the Old Testament, people were also promised an inheritance in God. So we see inheritance all through the language of, of, the, of the whole work of God's word, his Bible. But God also says that we are his inheritance as sons, as, as saints. So God loves us. He's sent his son, he's sent his spirit to seal us, and because of the gospel, we have sure hope that the spirit is working as we see we weren't, we're not what we were yesterday, but God is working out his goodness and his faithfulness progressively each day of our lives. And one day, one day when we see him face to face, we'll experience the full aspect of that inheritance because it will be in Christ himself. God's redemption is, required, is acquired by the Spirit. He seals us like you think of what happens in the tomb at Jesus. What do they do? They guard it and they seal it. And they can't stop Jesus from rising from the dead. The guards fell down as if dead, right? They, they can't stop it. And that's, the, that's how Christ seals us. Not like they sealed the tomb of Christ where they couldn't do anything, but how Christ rose again. He now comes and guards us by his by the very presence of his spirit. That's what gives us assurance that God is surely working. He's surely active. So the presence of God's spirit will not be undone, but continues to grow until we acquire the full possession of it. Although the inheritance of believers will certainly include the blessings of eternal fellowship with God because the spirit indwells people and it indwells us as believers, we can even now begin to enjoy the joy of that inheritance. We need to realize that that joy can be found in small tastes here on earth, in his, his people, in his word, as you look to him, as you trust him. Remember how the supernatural, the, the gift of faith is. The gospel says that you were sinners, and Jesus, the Lord of all, the Lamb of God, died for you. The world doesn't believe that. The, the gospel says that when, even when you were faithless, the faithful God has forgiven your past, laid claim on your life, and secured your future. The world doesn't believe that either. The gospel says that, that though you were dead in your trespasses and sins, Christ died for you, rose from the dead as a victor over your sin, and gives purpose to your life. And one day he's coming to claim you eternally. The world can't believe that either. So not only, not until the Holy Spirit comes and supernaturally changes the heart does anyone see the truth of the gospel. So your believing is evidence that the Holy Spirit is in you, working for your good and his glory. That's our God. The Holy Spirit has already enabled you to taste the sweetness of God in the gospel of your salvation. And it's giving you a foretaste of that glory that awaits and guarantees by his mark and belief in you. Already the Holy Spirit is, is using the gospel. Your spiritual world has been turned upside down and made new. Your belief is proof that the Bible is true. And when it says you are a new creation, we know that God surely has worked. In addition, this testimony of God's Spirit in your heart affirms that the Bible says that God's work throughout creation can be trusted. The Bible says that the entire creation is being conformed to the purpose of his glory. And we see, because he has witnessed, we have witnessed the recreating work of God in our hearts, we're able to trust that God 
in his word, it will ultimately renew all things. So all this is seen in the work that God's doing in the Holy Spirit through your lives. These are precious truths that give meaning and purpose and courage to our lives. I, 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 can know, <clears throat> I can know that nothing in my life is without purpose because I believe that the Savior died for me. He's risen for me. He, he lives in me by his Spirit. And such belief is itself an evidence that God is wor- has worked and continues to work. The presence of the Spirit brings purpose to your life. So God has a purpose for your life. Even in the weakness, the frailty, the sin, the fear, look to him. God, God will work all things out for his glory and your good because of the evidence of our belief that the Spirit has claims on us, not the world. God, God works in the real world. Think Paul is writing this letter under guard, awaiting trial, yet he knows he knows the reality of the kingdom is still at work. So all these things that seem contrary are actually working for God's glory and your good. God is stronger than all your failures. Trust him. God brings confidence in our faithlessness. He's faithful. God brings assurance even when we, we suffer or feel the, the weight of this fallen world. So Christ's salvation to his praise and glory is all about him. All about, he is the hero of the story, not us. He is the one who comes to rescue and redeem his people. He saves us by the power of his glory and will. So all throughout this passage, just to sum up here, this this long sentence, God, the, the triune God here is at work in and through your life. He was at work back in Ephesus. He's at work today. And so the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he chose, he predestined, he adopted, he redeemed, he forgave and sealed us in union with Christ. And so what does Christ do? He chose us, he predestined us, he blessed us in in himself, in the beloved, and redeemed us. And then the work of the Spirit is clearly seen. Every spiritual blessing comes from God. And the gifts, even the faith in Jesus Christ, seals us till that day. So God's given us a big picture here in this just one sentence. It's a big sentence, but in one sentence as we've gone through a couple weeks here, that God is at work. God is doing something that we can't see. It it reminds me um, that we need to be looking through spiritual eyes rather than physical, our own doubts and fears. We We should ask God to show us what he's doing. Uh, Brian Chappell, one of the commentaries I was reading, tells a story of a family who's struggling, and they realize their, their son, who, Robbie, who was born with multiple handicaps, both mental and physical, is it, about to graduate. And they, they realize they're going to lose a lot of support from the school system when that happens. And so how would the family care for their son? They, these are real questions. And a few days later, as, as he's sitting there in church and his pastor is declaring the benediction, he hears Robbie's voice in the back of the auditorium of the sanctuary saying, with the pastor, to our God is the power and authority now and forever. Amen. It it was Robbie who, from his wheelchair, was testifying of the power and sovereignty of our good God, past, present, future. How would Robbie believe? How could he believe? that these things, in light of all the anguish and suffering he had suffered, all, are, are all things working together, or are they not? They are working together for good. So faith in Christ rises above the world, above the earth, and it sees from God's perspective. Let us see from God's perspective. God's promises are sure. Every valley will be lifted. Every injustice made right. Every tear wiped away. Hearts healed. Bodies made whole, sad things become untrue because of the promises of God being realized. And then our our, our Savior is working in all things. Believe him. Just look to him. He holds you through it all. The Spirit speaks assurance in your heart and life. 
by all that he's doing in you and through you by the power of his, his spirit. This should be astounding. So this deposit, the deposit of God's spirit shows full redemption is ahead. All is in God's hands, even when we can't see it right away. And all is to the praise of God's glory. So even when you cannot do everything right, even when things seem all wrong, you are all right with God because he who chose you is working out everything in conformity with his purpose, his will, to the praise of his glory. And I close with this. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Lord, we are, we are just in awe of who you are. We are grateful that you didn't leave us on our own, that you didn't just say, go ahead, figure it out, DIY your faith. No, instead, you came and you sent your son to die on the cross, to find us, to redeem us, and you send your spirit even today in our midst. And so, Lord, I pray that you would fill this place with your spirit. You would fill each of us with your spirit to rest in the assurance that you are working, that you have worked, you are working, and that you will never stop working until we see you face to face. What an amazing, glorious God we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And before I, I um, read the benediction and we say, it, uh, I say the benediction, I just wanted to remind everyone that the 21st we're going to have a meeting for small groups. So if anyone's interested, if you're not sure, you know, come out to that Saturday meeting. I think it's at 4. It's in the bulletin. Um, but just to hear what small groups are about and how uh, you can have community in, in, in small groups, it's a great way just to study God's Word. We're going to be studying the holiness of God, which is a, a big topic, but... It's great in a small community where we can hear from one another as, as how God is good, he's constantly working, he's constantly active, and he's sovereign. And so I, I just want to challenge and, and just have you think, like maybe come out to that meeting and just get a glimpse of what small groups are about and, and plug into a small group. <laughs> All right, so I was thinking today we're going we're gonna to have the blessing for the road. It's actually Matthew 28, 18 through 20. You guys all probably know this one, but if you do, you can join in. <clears throat> and Jesus came and said to him, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. What a great God we serve. Amen. Amen.